Now I have here a fossil. It's a fossil fish, as you can see, preserved in stone and split right through the middle. There are millions of fossils of plants and animals all over the earth. They were, of course, once living, and they died, usually quickly, suddenly, under such conditions that they were preserved. The normal animal or plant, when it dies, is oxidized by bacteria and so on and disappears. But these have been preserved by the special circumstances, deposited in water, and here we have our fossil. Now, it's our purpose to look at these fossils and see what they can tell us about the past biological history of the Earth. many silent witnesses of forgotten ages. Not only man has witnesses for his past, the earth itself has them as well. Majestic mountains pushed up by incredible forces. Works of art created by wind and water, carving sculptures of immense, breathtaking beauty. They are silent. They speak no words. But if you listen very carefully and with patience, they will tell you their story. Like bricks set in place by a master bricklayer, the Earth's layers pile up, forming fantastic structures that thrust into the sky. And in these layers lie the best storytellers of them all. Thousands, millions of them, fossils. Stone remnants of once living plants and animals. Here are fossils of thousands of dinosaurs buried in a huge mass grave, almost immediately covered by mud and sand so their bones did not decay. They were fossilized. From their remains, carefully separated from the rocks surrounding them, we can get a good idea of their immense size and strength. This fish, how did it come here? And how, in that age long past, did it come to be entombed in this rock? If you have an aquarium at home, you've probably experienced this sad event. One of your fish dies, floats to the surface, and then quickly decays. In nature, of course, there are other ways of dying. This way or another, in very little time, nothing is left. Unless something unexpected happens. Unless, for instance, the fish are suffocated by an overwhelming amount of mud and sand. Then they may petrify and become everlasting fossils in a rather short period of time. Only a global flood seems adequate to explain the massive numbers of fossils as we find them. Now, amongst all the millions of fossils that have been found, scientists have tried to introduce some sort of order. And the order that they've produced is the order of the so-called geological column. The first layer, which is supposed to have been settling down onto the crystalline base rock, is the Precambrium. Then you go to the Cambrium, right through the Triassic, and then through to the Quaternary and recent, where you find man's fossils. Now, it's very important to be able to date 
the fossils which have been found. And this is done by the index fossil method. It has been found that in, say, the Cambrium, you do get, typically, the trilobite. Now, fossils which are typical are called, then, index fossils. And they're dated by the position they occupy in the geological column. The trouble is that you can't always, or you very seldom, do find a column like this. So we must have another way of dating uh, the, the column. How do evolutionists determine the age of these fossils made of hard rock? What method do they use, for instance, to date these dinosaur bones? Are they really millions of years old, as evolutionists claim? It is important to point out that dinosaur remains have not been proven to be millions of years old. This is simply part of the theory of evolution. If you asked an evolutionary paleontologist how old a particular dinosaur bone was, he would probably do the following. First, he would try to determine what creature the bone had belonged to. Next, he would determine what layer of rock the fossil was buried in. Then, he would look up the layer of rock in a geology book or chart. The paleontologist would then tell you that the bone was, for instance, 100 million years old. He would say that the bone was that old because the rock in which it was buried was 100 million years old. However, if we ask the geologist who wrote the geology book how he knew the rock's age, he would probably tell us that he was sure the rock was at least 100 million years old because it had this particular kind of dinosaur fossil in it. So what you're actually doing is this. You're dating the fossil by the layer, and then you're dating the layer by the fossil. Now, this is uh, known as circular reasoning, and is, of course, not exactly the highest form of logic. If, as the evolutionary theory claims, one species gradually evolved into another one, then we would surely expect to find many of these intermediate types. Fish that began to be amphibians, or reptiles that started to grow wings. Dr. Dwayne Gish of the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego knows a lot about that. So let's hear what he has to say. The fossil record is often cited by evolutionists as support for the theory of evolution. Actually, the fossil record is an embarrassment to the theory of, of evolution and provides support for the concept of direct special creation. For example, if the theory of evolution were true, then the fossil record should begin with very simple forms of life which gradually evolve into more and more complex forms of life. And of course, if the theory of evolution is true, then there should be a tremendous number of intermediate types or transitional forms or what we might call the in-between kinds. On the other hand, if creation is true, the fossil record would begin with very complex forms of life for which we can find no evolutionary ancestors. And if creation is true, we would expect to find no transitional form between the created kinds or the basic types of plants or animals. Now let's take a look at the fossil record and see what it actually does reveal. In Cambrian rocks, which evolutionists maintain were laid down beginning about 600 million years ago, we find a tremendous assortment of very complex forms of life. For example, we find the trilobites. They are so complex that evolutionists have estimated that their evolutionary origin would have required perhaps 2,000 million years. Now, if all of this is true, then, in the Precambrian rocks, rocks which generally 
are found below Cambrian rocks, in those Precambrian rocks we must find the evolutionary ancestors of these complex invertebrates. Many of these rocks are undisturbed and perfectly suitable for the preservation of fossils. What do we find in those Precambrian rocks? Well, certainly we can say this. Nowhere on the face of the earth has anyone ever been able to find the evolutionary ancestors of these Cambrian animals. No evolutionary ancestors for sponges or jellyfish or sea cucumbers or sea urchins or brachiopods or worms or any of these creatures have ever been found. They have found what they believe to be fossils of microscopic bacteria and algae, single-celled microscopic creatures, but nothing in between has ever been found. In other words, these complex animals appear abruptly, fully formed, with no evolutionary ancestors. And this is what we, of course, would expect on the basis of creation. Now, evolutionists also believe that one of these invertebrates gave rise to vertebrates and they believe the fishes were the first vertebrates. Vertebrates are animals which have internal skeletons or backbones in contrast to the invertebrates, which are either soft-bodied or have shells. They believe that this transition from the invertebrates to the vertebrates took about, oh, 100 million years. Now, if that's true, then, of course, we must find a vast number of these intermediate types in the fossil record. What do we actually find? Not one single transitional form has ever been found. The fishes appear abruptly fully formed and absolutely no ancestors for the fishes have ever been found. So we're left with the same conclusion regarding the rest of the story of the fossil record. No intermediate types between invertebrates and vertebrates. No intermediate types between fish and amphibians. None between amphibians and reptiles. And none between reptiles and mammals. To make a long, complex story a bit shorter, no intermediate types at all have ever been found anywhere in the world, neither living nor fossil. But could we have just missed them or overlooked them? Let's look at one of the most important steps, one that could hardly be overlooked, the development of flight. The ability to fly is an amazing thing. It requires a coordination of muscle, brain, and bone that seems to point so clearly to intelligent, creative design. But according to evolution, flight developed by time, chance, the struggle for survival. Flight actually occurs in uh, four different groups, the insects, the reptiles, the mammals, and the birds. When it comes to insects, the first insects of flying forms to leave a fossil record have wings completely developed, fully functional, just like those insects we have today. When it comes to the flying reptiles, the pterodactyls, they had huge wings made out of membranes that would stretch as far as 52 feet. Surely, if these forms had evolved from running reptiles, there ought to be hundreds of transitional forms at least to show how that change from leg to wing occurred. So far, not one, not one transitional form has been found. When it comes to the mammals, the flying mammals are the bats. These are among the most highly special groups of mammals we have, and yet they occur early in the fossil record of mammals, and they look just like the kinds of bats we have today. When it comes to these groups, the insects, the reptiles, and the mammals, the evidence is crystal clear. The kind of integration of parts we see seems to point so clearly to creation. If evolution were true, we ought to have thousands of transitional forms, and yet not one has ever been found. But when it comes to birds, the story changes a little bit. Here, at least, the evolutionists believe they found one example of a missing link. It's an unusual kind of bird called Archaeopteryx. Now, Archaeopteryx has wings, and it has feathers like a bird, but on those wings are claws. There's no keel down the breastbone. In the bill are teeth. These are all things we would normally associate with reptiles. I used to tell my university classes that myself when I taught evolution. Here's a perfect example of a missing link that's been found. 
Well, let's take a second look at that Archaeopteryx. When you take a look, for instance, at the teeth, we find, sure enough, no living birds have teeth, but some fossil birds have teeth. Some reptiles have teeth and some don't. That particular characteristic is not really important in distinguishing the two groups. Claws on the wings? There's some living birds, like the ostrich, that have claws on the wings. Lack of a keel? It turns out that Archaeopteryx has an extremely robust furcula, or wishbone. That's where the muscles attach for the power stroke in flight. As a matter of fact, the feather of Archaeopteryx shows the shaft down the leading edge, a characteristic of strong flyers. Most scientists, in fact, now no longer regard Archaeopteryx as primitive, but a strong flyer. What about that transition from legs to wings? Again, in Archaeopteryx, we have fully developed, completely functional wings, no hint as to how legs could evolve into wings. Feathers? In Archaeopteryx, they appear complete, fully developed, with all the little hooks and eyelets holding them together. We see no hint of how scales could have evolved into feathers. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, we found bones of just regular birds in the same geologic formation as those of Archaeopteryx. The Archaeopteryx specimens we have, then, could not be the ancestors of those birds. It looks like, in this case, too, the evidence favors creation. Different kinds of birds of many varieties existing right from their first appearance in the fossil sequence. About the only other example that evolutionists use is another one that I used to use with my class is the horse. In this case, it seems like there might be a transition from one kind of structure to another. The story pictures evolution from a small animal with many toes to a large animal with only one toe. More detailed information has now forced us to abandon that particular idea. When it comes to the size difference, we find that's not crucial. It's now possible to breed horses that are only 15 inches tall. What about the so-called dawn horse? We now know that it's not a horse at all. Instead, it's a rock badger or a coney, what scientists would call a hyrax. The official name, as a matter of fact, for that dawn horse is Hyracotherium. It's the ancestor not of the horses, but of the rock badgers or conies that still live on Earth today. What about the in-between forms that show how the toe number was gradually reduced? Again, in this case, all of the in-between forms are found buried in the same geological formation, which indicated they lived at the same time and couldn't have been the ancestors one of the other. Instead, it's more like a scene we might see around an African waterhole where animals of many sizes and shapes, animals with a few toes, with many toes, all live together at the same time. impressive sights on Earth. Hot, dry, and barren, it stretches out over hundreds of miles. Like layers in a cake, the different strata lie one upon the other. Most of them, sedimentary rocks, are deposited by water, settling when the water recedes, only to be covered by a new layer washed in by succeeding waters. The geologist Dr. Art Chadwick from Loma Linda University of California has spent many years in the canyon. Carefully, he examines the specific properties of each layer and from time to time publishes his findings in geological scientific journals. 600 feet. Together with his assistant, he measures the landscape and the characteristics of the different layers tell their own story. The unique thing about the Grand Canyon is that the layers are exposed to view. The layers themselves are not unique. They're found in many, many parts of the world. But here we can see exposed over a mile deep 
the layers that comprise the surface of the Earth, which are exposed only superficially elsewhere. Our study took us to an area to the west of here in Monadnock Creek, where there is a cliff that stands over 800 feet above the surrounding floor. In this particular area, the sediments on top of the cliff are found also off the cliff at an elevation almost 500 feet lower. This would suggest that at least 500 or, or 600 feet of water were present at the time these layers were deposited. Since these layers required a lot of energy to be laid down, it follows that the processes involved must have also been energetic processes. This flies in the face of traditional thinking about how the layers got here. In fact, these layers must have come in here very rapidly. This is not to say that the entire column accumulated in a short time necessarily, but it's consistent with the idea that a single layer came here almost instantaneously by a process known as turbidity currents or something similar to that. Turbidity currents have come to be recognized in the last 30 or 40 years as important processes in sedimentation. The unique thing about them is that they occur so fast. The sediment is deposited in areas up to 100,000 square miles at 50 or 60 miles an hour, the sediment moves across the floor. So we can accumulate great quantities of sediment in a given area very rapidly. This has changed our whole thinking about the processes that came to lay these layers here in the canyon. Not only do geologic studies show that most of the layers of the canyon were formed quickly under massive flood conditions, but they also indicate that the canyon was eroded into its present basic form very rapidly. It was not the slow-paced erosion of the Colorado River that carved the bulk of the canyon, a process that would have taken millions of years. The canyon seems to have had a much more catastrophic origin. Many creationists believe that most of this awesome series of formations originated in the spectacular upheavals and after-effects of the great worldwide flood of Noah's day. These eroding cliffs here on the edge of the Pacific Ocean near San Diego, California, give a rather good picture of the tremendous power that's available in moving water when it's acting with its full intensity. And so the question about whether the flood could have really done significant geological work, I think is obviously yes. I said, just what caused the flood and how it was that the world was covered with water we may not know all of the answers. The Bible does say in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And the uh, word overflowed in the English Bible is really cataclysmed in the Greek. In other words, it speaks of a worldwide cataclysm in which the whole geology and uh, geography and topography of the earth was changed. From the Grand Canyon to another fossil mass grave, coal seams. Deep inside the earth, the black gold can be dug. What exactly is coal? Coal is the remains of huge masses of buried plant material. In many places, the main ingredient was sheets of bark from huge ancient trees. Pressed and carbonized, these blackened remains have come to serve as a valuable source of energy. Since coal seams are not found being formed anywhere today, many researchers have wondered what circumstances caused these vast formations. How exactly was coal formed? Geologist and coal expert, Dr. Stephen Austin, has studied that question extensively. There are two theories for the origin of coal. One theory is the swamp theory, and the second theory is the flood theory. The swamp theory suggests that the plants that we see forming this coal formed millions of years ago in swamps. The buildup of plant material 
formed a thick layer of peat. And the, this became later compacted and hardened into the rock we today call coal. The uh, second theory is the, is the flood theory. This suggests that the plants that formed the coal did not grow in place, but were transported from some other location. In other words, that they were washed in or transported by water. Coal deposits are always found in sediments deposited in water and are commonly associated with huge quantities of marine fossils. Dr. Austin's extensive research on coal seams in the United States has shown that many coal layers were originally deposited on the ocean floor beneath huge floating masses of vegetation. These mats of buoyant debris were made up of whole forests of uprooted trees and plants swept away from land in a massive catastrophic flood under conditions like Noah's flood. Waterlogged plant matter, particularly including loosened tree bark, sunk to the bottom beneath the floating mats as they were driven about by winds, waves, and currents. Many layers of plant debris were built up in this way and subsequently buried beneath muddy sediments which later hardened into rock. As a result of this flood deposition, in some instances, fossil tree trunks can be found buried at various angles and extending through thick layers of coal and other sediments. But how long does it take to transform the plants into coal? Most people think that it takes thousands or millions of years to form coal. But that's not true. The idea that coal takes a long period of time to form is not substantiated geologically because we can actually form coal in the laboratory in a brief period of time. Pressure is not the major factor in forming coal because in many areas, especially here in the eastern part of the United States, the coal is uh, in very twisted and deformed stratum that have been subjected to huge amounts of pressure and yet they do not show the effect of coalification like they should if pressure is the factor that forms coal. The final uh, factor that's forming coal is temperature and most everybody now agrees that temperature is the major factor contributing to coal. A brief short time heating event can explain the alteration of the plants to form this hard and compact and black rock that we see today. What final conclusion can we draw from these facts? During our trip through nature in search of fossil evidence, we have fixed evidence on these following points. In the first place, it's perfectly easy for coal to have been made from masses of vegetative material by high pressure and high temperature in a matter of minutes or hours according to the pressure and the temperature. So the long time periods needed for the carboniferous uh, layers are not necessary. The second point is that we have found no evidence of the intermediate forms which ought to exist according to evolutionary theory between the various species. Now, if this is the case, then there is no evidence of a scientific nature against the postulate of a special creation followed by um, catastrophe on a universal scale which produced the mass graves for which we have very large evidence. And if that is the case, then the evidence against special creation does not exist but there is strong evidence against evolutionary theory. And here, at the Grand Canyon, the search for our origins ends. As the sun goes down, the day draws to a close, and one wonders if this awesome devastation could happen to an Earth so beautiful, so lovingly created by God. Could it happen again? The Bible says it will. This earth will be judged not by water, but by fire. 
and again because of the sin and wickedness of man. Is there an escape? The Bible says that whoever puts his life in the hands of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will be saved. Through God's grace, you can make that decision at this very moment and be saved for all eternity. And please, don't wait, because no man knows the day or the hour.